A lot of coverage of the war in Ukraine tends to focus on the search for the next high-tech, game-changing weapon. The Russians, for example, hyped up the capabilities of their Kinsale hypersonic missile. Meanwhile, the arrival of a relatively small number of modern Western main battle tanks was preceded by a massive public debate and media campaign. But under extremely tough battlefield conditions, there's only so much a relatively small number of tanks can achieve. Instead, much of the story of this war has been about the massive employment and consumption of relatively basic systems. Small drones, landmines, shoulder-fired missiles, and of course, the artillery. The howitzers, mortars, and MLRS systems of Ukraine and Russia have been absolutely critical, whereas fewer than a few dozen hypersonic missiles have been fired. A soldier in a trench may never see a hypersonic missile strike a target or a western main battle tank rolling across a field. But almost wherever you are in Ukraine, you can guarantee that artillery shell fire will be a constant fact of life. I first talked about the centrality of this artillery war more than a year ago, and time has only reinforced rather than undermined its importance. And at the heart of that struggle is a bottomless demand for artillery ammunition. There, while Russia pulls from depleting but still very significant stockpiles, Ukraine is highly dependent on constant deliveries from its allies, countries which face the challenge of finding more shells from depleting storages at a time when industrial production has not yet caught up with demand. It's that desperate need for more ammunition that seems to have been at the heart of the recent US announcement that it would send cluster munitions to Ukraine. These are controversial weapons banned by a number of countries around the world. They can leave behind significant amounts of dud and unexploded ordnance that require an area be demined and cleared before it's safe for civilians to move through again. But they're also arguably highly effective weapons that are available in very large numbers. All right, so what am I gonna be talking about today? First, I'll look at the role of artillery in Ukraine in 2023 and the changes in tactics that we're seeing from both sides. Then I'll look at the question of losses, trends, and attrition, focusing specifically on the artillery systems themselves before transitioning into the heart of this episode, ammunition consumption, ammunition production, and the recent decision to provide cluster munitions to Ukraine as a boost to its short-term ammunition sustainability. I'll ask what impact cluster munitions might have, how efforts to ramp up ammunition production are going, and ask what all this might mean for the artillery campaign going forward. So we'll start with a look at the almost omnipresent role of artillery systems in this war. Because while jets and tanks win headlines both in battlefield reporting and in a focus on armament aid, both the Russian and Ukrainian armies still share a whole lot of Soviet DNA. And a Soviet-style army without artillery is like a soccer team without a goalie. It may just work if the stars align and the opponent is incompetent, but more likely the whole thing is just going to fall apart in spectacular fashion. That's even more true in Ukraine where after more than 500 days of fighting, we're still talking about a contested airspace environment. As it stands, ground-based artillery is the best option for most fire missions. And as that vital piece in the puzzle, it plays a couple of critical roles. The first is as a major driver of the constant attrition, which is a nice way of saying that of all the stuff that gets blown up in Ukraine, a significant amount of it is blown up by artillery fire. Based on both reporting from both sides and what we can see from the visually confirmed losses, as in many historical conflicts, a lion's share of equipment and personnel losses are being driven by artillery fire. Call of Duty may have tried to convince a generation that most personnel losses are driven by a couple of skilled psychopaths running around shooting people with guns which are at least 80% attachments. The far more boring, far scarier answer is that the greatest danger on the modern battlefield remains by a rain of unfeeling artillery shells addressed not to you personally, but instead to a set of grid coordinates. Now, an important thing to note here is that just because artillery is the primary driver of casualties, it does not therefore follow that whoever fires more artillery is automatically going to cause more casualties. The reality is, of course, that there's a lot more that goes into how many casualties artillery fire causes than just the raw number of shells fired, although that does help. Target type and exposure matter, for example. Troops heavily dug in are going to take less casualties, all else being equal from artillery fire, than a squad in the open. Precision and responsiveness are also huge factors. If the fire doesn't arrive until the target has already moved, then you're not going to hit anyone. Which leads into the centrality of accuracy, because in the end, no amount of misses is going to make up for a hit. You don't get a participation trophy for turning an empty field into a lunar hellscape. Then there's the question of target selection. If it's not valuable or central or with a high probability of kill, they might withhold. Whereas particularly in 2022, when Russian ammunition supplies were more robust, Reports from both sides include examples like Russian artillery gunners saturating an area in order to engage a single tank. 
and all of that skips the physical properties of the round involved. If you're in an armoured vehicle, the results of a near miss by a small mortar round might be very, very different from a nearby impact of a 203mm high explosive shell. All of this is to say that the attritional role of artillery is critical. But as always, modelling that attrition is a lot more complicated than simply counting projectiles. Beyond just causing attrition, the artillery is also a key enabler for offensive action. The artillery drives the attrition that creates the gaps for assault units to move into. It denies certain equipment the ability to move up to the forward edge of the battle area. So the opposing force can't have his electronic warfare or his tanks or his short-range air defences right up at the contact line to repel assaults. Because if he did, they would just be shelled by the artillery. And because that equipment has to be kept further back, it's easier for attacking units, drone operators and infantry to operate. The artillery can help create operational encirclements by shelling roads and railways that are critical to supporting forward positions. And during an attack itself, it can critically work to suppress or destroy the defenders and then to protect the assaulting forces from any counterattacks that might be coming their way. But while the artillery is critical to enabling offensive operations, it's also one of the reasons they're so difficult. In order to attack successfully, you want to be able to concentrate your force. But it's difficult to concentrate if drones are constantly circling, ready to call in fire as soon as you start trying to bring a force together. A few infantry in a trench might not be worth a fire mission. A concentration of armoured vehicles getting ready for an assault absolutely is. Similarly, supporting artillery massively increases the difficulty involved in breaching any prepared defensive position or obstacle. Clearing or moving through a minefield, for example, isn't a barrel of laughs at the best of times. But with the right equipment, say for example some mine rolling or mine clearing vehicles and some patience, it can be done mostly safely. What is not safe at all, however, is breaching a minefield while in view of opposing artillery. That's for a range of reasons, including the fact that you are moving through a minefield and so one, the attacking force is probably going to move slower than over an open field with no mines, and secondly, everyone's going to want to concentrate into columns to make sure they're moving through the cleared areas rather than the places that still, you know, have mines. Now, a slow-moving column of vehicles might be the right approach to moving through a minefield, but at the same time, it's also what A-10 pilots and artillery gunners presumably go to sleep at night dreaming about. By trying to avoid the explosives buried in the ground, you make yourself very vulnerable to explosives falling out of the sky. The somewhat static battlefield and the difficulties faced by both Russian and Ukrainian offensives against defensive mine-protected positions in Ukraine are not just a product of landmines or shoulder-fired missiles, they also owe a lot to the efforts of the defending artillery. And were, for example, suddenly every Russian artillery piece in Zaporizhia to disappear, you would expect the Ukrainian counteroffensive would pick up pace very, very quickly. Most of those fundamentals have been true since the relatively early days of Russia's full-scale invasion. But in terms of the precise tools and tactics being employed by both sides, we've actually seen a fair amount of change in adaptation since I first covered the artillery war more than a year ago. That's not surprising because ultimately armies historically are learning organisms. Troops, generally speaking, have pretty strong incentives to survive, and if getting better at your job improves your odds of survival, well, then you're probably going to try and find new and innovative ways to not get blown up. At a more central level, the Russian army is believed to have a lessons learned process, wherein new approaches that work are intended to be captured, studied, and potentially disseminated throughout the entire organisation. And so, while reporting bad news may be strongly discouraged in some cases, we have seen the Russians, and of course the Ukrainians too, continue to evolve the way they fight. In May 2023, Rusi released a report on changing Russian tactics in the second year of their full-scale invasion of Ukraine. In that report, Rusi noted a number of changes in the way the Russian artillery was operating and being controlled. Now, of course, I'd encourage anyone who's interested to read that report, but there's a few points which stood out to me. These focused on efforts to better integrate drones and to increase the responsiveness of the Russian artillery. This included the better distribution of drones to commanders and in particular artillery brigade commanders and improved processes for leveraging fires. When these new systems work and a commander spots a target with the drone directly, the response time from Russian artillery reportedly might be as short as three to five minutes. That would be a significant improvement over the reported times that were being routinely achieved in the early war and it would consequently make life much more dangerous for Ukrainian targets. We've also seen trends emerge of both sides changing the way they handle the counter-battery fight, that is the effort for artillery on one side to kill the artillery on the other. 
On the Russian side, this is a significant employment of the Lancet loitering munition. These things account for a disproportionately large share of visually confirmed Ukrainian artillery losses. Now, on one hand, there's a reason that Lancet might appear a lot in visually confirmed loss data. In order to work, it needs a drone observing the target to direct the loitering munition to hit it. That means in any scenario where you hit a target with a Lancet, you're probably going to have a film of it happening, and if you can recover the drone, something to upload to the internet. Whereas if you fire on an enemy artillery position that you detect using a counter-battery radar, for example, you're not going to have any video of that attack hitting its target. Unless, of course, you happen to have a drone circling the area ready to observe, but if that was the case, why did you need the counter-battery radar? Now, a report that you fired shells into the distance might be enough to convince the Russian Ministry of Defense that you've destroyed another eight high Mars, but it's not generally going to convince the internet. All that said, Lancet appears to still be a significant problem. And if you care about the efficient use of munitions, it's far more efficient to use a couple of loitering munitions to destroy an artillery piece than to saturate an area with high explosives the way they were in the early stages of the invasion. On the Ukrainian side, we've recently seen more use of HIMARS systems switching from hunting ammunition depots to hunting artillery pieces and batteries. This might be explained both by the fact that Russia has dispersed and protected more of its operational targets, moving them out of range or better protecting them with jammers and air defences, but also just because the precision and payload of Gimlers makes it a pretty effective counter-battery weapon. A HIMARS or M270 system can engage a battery of self-propelled guns from well beyond its range and ability to respond, and given the value of artillery pieces and their crews, it's hard to argue this isn't a very efficient use of the system. All of those offensive adaptations follow hand-in-hand hand with defensive adaptations, because as I said earlier, people generally have a pretty strong incentive not to die. And even if you have those strange few individuals who don't mind, it's the ones who survive who ultimately get to write the tactical manuals and train the next generation of operators. We've seen a number of adaptations aimed at reducing the effectiveness of some of the most dangerous systems. Ukrainians putting protective nets around their artillery pieces to protect from lancets, increased deployment of counter-unmanned aerial system jammers and systems to keep drones away from these positions, although obviously no defense is foolproof. Rusi reports that in many cases, Russian artillery has gotten better at relocating between multiple firing positions, so they're not constantly sitting in the same place, waiting for their inevitable demise. And Russian air defense troops and electronic warfare units are constantly working on better defenses and countermeasures against things like GMLRS. Russian jammers can't stop Gimler's attacks, but they might be able to degrade its accuracy under certain circumstances. And Rusi, as well as Russian sources, attest that Russian ground-based air defences are sometimes able to intercept incoming Gimlin's rockets. That's obviously not a solution for all targets. A giant ammunition depot might have shore rad protection. Private Conscriptovich in his trench probably doesn't. But it is a notable defensive adaptation nonetheless. And as the number of drones and FPVs on the battlefield continues to increase, circling constantly like a band of particularly murderous paparazzi, defensive adaptations are likely to become ever more important. They cannot, however, be perfect. And that makes for a survival challenge if you're an artillery crew in Ukraine. Because both sides deeply understand the importance of fires to their opponent. And if they ever forget, they're going to be constantly reminded every time a shell or a rocket lands nearby. The problem with being a team MVP, however, is it marks you out as a target for every player on the opposing team. And so I think it's also important we talk about artillery losses and attrition on both sides. Now, all the usual caveats that apply when assessing losses and attrition apply doubly so to artillery pieces. Usually, these systems will be well behind the lines and often difficult to film relative to something like a tank or an IFV that's likely to be on the front line. I'd suggest that means that while visually confirmed loss data might be useful for identifying trends, patterns, or relative rates of loss between both sides, we're much, much more likely to be looking at a significant undercount when we use this data than an overcount. At time of recording, Russia is visually confirmed to have lost approximately 940 artillery pieces in Ukraine since February 2022, destroyed, damaged, or captured, as well as about 103 artillery support vehicles. The equivalent figure for Ukraine is 357. It's important to remember those are aggregate numbers and don't really tell the full story. For example, the ratio between Ukrainian and Russian losses is far wider on things like MLRS systems and self-propelled guns than it is on towed artillery. That's significant because not all losses have equal value. A towed gun from the mid-Cold War, all else being equal, is probably worth less than a modernized self-propelled gun. 
You could dig in even further and look at the specific types of systems that have been destroyed. If those 47 lost Ukrainian MLRS systems, for example, had been HIMARS, MARS, and M270 systems, then Ukrainian combat power might have suffered a significant hit. But they're not. None of those systems are visually confirmed lost yet. Instead, the vast majority were actually grads, and one of them was a pickup truck with rockets mounted in the flatbed. That's not to say those losses don't matter, but the distinction is important. In a similar vein, among those 234 visually confirmed Russian systems, there's only one of the 300mm heavy hitters, a single BM-30 lost in the vicinity of Izium. If you look at only the most recent data, however, there's an indication that the gap between Russian and Ukrainian losses may have been widening. And as we've talked about before, I think this may be evidence of an increased Ukrainian focus on counter-battery fire, an attempt to eliminate the Russian artillery that's helping to hold Russian defensive positions. There's a few points of evidence that I think point in that direction. The first is that the ratio in recent visually confirmed artillery losses has indeed widened. Over the course of July so far, 40 Russian artillery pieces have been visually confirmed destroyed against eight Ukrainian ones. That's a much more favourable ratio than Ukraine has enjoyed for the war as a whole, which is closer to 3 to 1. It could of course be a data anomaly, but if Russian artillery losses are spiking, then an increase in Ukrainian counter-battery efforts does seem like a more likely explanation than Ukrainian artillery just suddenly getting good. The upswing in observed losses follows an increase in claimed losses. Overall, in June and July, it's been pretty routine to see the Ukrainian general staff claiming to have destroyed Russian artillery at between two and three times the rate that they would normally claim them over the war as a whole. Again, I would be very cautious about using official Ukrainian statistics to generate loss estimates. But they may, I think, provide a clue when it comes to identifying patterns or trends. A final clue comes from the Russians themselves. It was recently reported that the Russian commander of the 58th Combined Arms Army, General Ivan Popov, has been relieved of command. The 58th, for those of you who are interested, is one of the Russian formations that's been directly opposing Ukrainian counteroffensives in Zaporizhia, fighting on some of the hottest areas of the front. An audio message to his troops, reportedly recorded by Popov after he was removed, claims that the reason for his removal by Chief of the General Staff, Valery Grasimov, was for telling the truth. Popov reportedly painted a grim picture, saying that his forces had taken heavy losses, desperately required rotation, and he made some interesting comments in relation to artillery specifically. He reportedly said in that message, quote, I drew attention to the greatest tragedy of modern war, the lack of artillery reconnaissance and counter-battery, end quote while also referring to the mass death and injury of his troops by enemy artillery. Popov reportedly referred to the present situation as a betrayal by the high command, and it's claimed that he was removed by Gerasimov for alleged blackmail when he said he would take his complaints directly to Putin. Now, the key point of focus here is not that another Russian commander may have been removed from their position for trying to tell it like it is. Instead, my focus here is on what he said about the artillery duel and the losses his forces are taking. Because make no mistake, I would think that the available evidence suggests that overall, Russia continues to enjoy a greater supply of artillery pieces and continues to fire more ammunition. But that doesn't mean that they enjoy fire superiority at every individual point along the front. That's likely to be a very important effort given just how dependent Russia is on artillery both in attack and defence. Take that advantage away and it's kind of like watching a tennis player try and play without a racket. They might flail around for a couple of minutes, but in the end, trying to slap the ball with your hands just isn't going to have the same effect. Of course, Russia has a massive reserve of guns and shells to pull from, and in order to wear those reserves down, Ukraine is going to need replacements of its own. And given the state of Ukrainian war industry, while a couple of guns might be produced domestically, the overwhelming source for Ukrainian replacements has been foreign aid. What you're seeing on screen there is a comparison of visually confirmed losses, resupply declared, so not necessarily delivered, but pledged by foreign nations, and finally what I'm calling the weighted capture rate, which is basically built on the assumption that not every piece of captured equipment will be suitable for going into service, and so basically I multiply the captured Russian equipment by 0.3 in order to give what I think is a more realistic estimate. Now, according to that graph, the total Ukrainian artillery park of towed artillery, self-propelled guns, and MLRS systems has increased by almost 400 over the course of the war. But again, that doesn't really capture the whole picture. It doesn't account for non-visually confirmed losses, which I think in relation to artillery is likely to be significant. It doesn't account for the fact the Ukrainian army is several times larger now than it was in February 2022, 
and so the number of guns per brigade has probably fallen significantly. It doesn't reflect the fact that damaged guns may be repaired and put into action, nor, and this is critical, does it capture the slow conversion of Ukrainian ground-based fires over to increasingly Western standards. On one hand, that's fantastic for Ukraine because these new systems tend to be more accurate, longer ranged, more destructive, and generally more capable than the Soviet systems that they're replacing, or rather the Soviet systems that they're often augmenting. But at the same time, it now means that Ukraine's artillery park is some sort of bizarre menagerie, including everything from modern German giants to World War II relics to helicopter rocket pods strapped to the back of trucks. Most nations, for example, would generally operate maybe two or three types of howitzer. Ukraine reportedly has something like 14 in service. And that, I imagine, has to be a significant drag on a whole bunch of quarter mastery and sustainment efforts. It means different types of ammunition, different types of spare parts, different repair processes, different supply chains, and I have to presume a near endless supply of coffee and energy drinks to whatever poor sods in the Ukrainian military or Ministry of Defense that are responsible for sustaining this collection. And that's especially important with artillery systems because attrition isn't just driven by destruction. You don't lose guns just because the enemy finds them and destroys them, or that certainly doesn't help. Guns go out of action for a variety of reasons. I've seen some estimates that up to a third of all Ukrainian artillery might be down for repairs at any given moment. But while you can repair a vehicle or a mount, you usually can't repair a gun barrel. As a cannon fires more rounds, first it loses accuracy, and then eventually it can lose structural integrity and fail catastrophically. Which means if you're firing rounds downrange, you better be getting results, because you're not just expending ammunition, you're also slowly expending the gun itself. And this is probably one of the largely invisible, but also significant factors in Ukraine. Barrels can have a range of service lives. Tank barrels firing high-velocity ammunition can be measured in hundreds. Artillery systems, maybe one to two thousand. And in one case, it's claimed the Ukrainian PZH-2000 fired 20,000 rounds from one barrel. And while I can't imagine the gun was particularly accurate at that point, I think it demonstrates pretty well some tropes about German engineering. The PZH-2000 is expensive, it's heavy, it's sometimes finicky. There are even stories of Ukrainian crews saying they have to make sure they wipe the mud off their shoes before they get inside the interior. Because compared to a Soviet-era shitbox that'll survive a nuclear explosion, the PZH-2000 is a little sensitive. But when you need peak performance and a quality of metallurgy that will deliver far beyond the design specifications, the Germans often get it right. But for the sake of illustration, let's take a generous average and say that your average barrel is meant to have a 2000 EFC service life. That would mean that while Russia has lost fewer than 1000 systems visually confirmed since the February invasion in 2022, Just in 2022, firing an approximate 12 million rounds, Russia would have burned out about 6,000 barrels. And until humanity masters the art of forging adamantium barrels for our cannon, this will likely remain a critical concern for forces engaged in conflicts like this one. A final interesting point here, tangentially linked to that 6,000 figure, is that we do have some data to help us estimate Russian artillery losses beside just the visually confirmed ones. One mechanism, albeit an imperfect one, is to observe Russian artillery storages and see how quickly they pull guns out of reserve. That's always going to be an imperfect approach because a gun may be intended to upgun the existing force rather than replace a loss, for example. But that doesn't mean the data can't provide us interesting insights. And because it's 2023, YouTubers buying satellite data and counting artillery pieces is absolutely a thing. The current undisputed YouTube king in this area is Covert Cabal, whose video on artillery systems I'll link below. Using a variety of images of Russian artillery depots, some of which unfortunately dated back to 2022, Covert recently estimated that 5,535 artillery pieces, not including MLRS systems, have been pulled out of Russian storage. I am looking at getting some custom imagery taken in order to close the time gap in the most significant of cases, because again, this is 2023 and you can command your own spy satellite as long as you're willing to pay through the nose for it. Further to that rough count of somewhere between five and 6,000 guns disappearing from storage, it's also notable that some systems look like either they're being disturbed for potential repair or potentially to act as spare parts donors to repair other systems. In any case, the key point here is that while Russia did begin the war with a massive reserve of artillery pieces, they do seem to be burning through them by the literal thousands. And beyond that challenge, faced by both sides of continuing to supply enough guns and barrels, there's another challenge, perhaps even more dire, in trying to feed those guns a sufficient supply of artillery ammunition. 
In some ways, the war in Ukraine is following some of the best available historical parallels in this regard. Major conventional wars like World War I and Korea featured shell crises, where major powers suddenly realised that they had nowhere near enough artillery ammunition to meet consumption rates. At this point, I think it's fair to say that's happened in Ukraine as well. Secondly, if you look at the historical when of these sort of shortages, year two seems like a pretty common point, with the shell crisis of 1915 nearly bringing down the British government. That's because often there is a point to which your pre-war stockpiles will take you, and a point in the future where your industry will catch up with demand, and in between there is a valley of death. And this war, I would argue, is currently deep in that valley. If you're trying to put a number on current consumption rates on both sides, it can be difficult because different commentators and organisations can give vastly different estimates. There are actually some good reasons that those estimates might diverge. Different organisations include different things in the definition of what is or isn't an artillery shell. Sometimes people are talking only about howitzer rounds or howitzer and MLRS ammunition, but what about 125mm tank shells? What about heavy mortar rounds? So my personal request to any organisation putting out a number is please include a footnote with what you are including in your estimate. To get a sense of a variety of the estimates that are out there, Josef Burrell estimated 50,000 Russian artillery rounds fired per day versus 6 to 7,000 for Ukraine. Rusi gave a range estimate between 12 and 36,000, again for Russian rounds fired per day. And Ukrainian sources themselves generate a wide variety of figures, with the one constant being that Russia flings many times more shells than they do. Ukraine's request to the European Union was for more than a quarter of a million artillery shells per month. Under the current plan, they'll get 83,000. Assuming, that said, everything goes right. And if delivered, that would translate into just over 2,700 rounds per day. Certainly helpful, but not equivalent to any of the main estimates I've seen for Russian daily expenditure. And yet, I would argue both sides are experiencing severe ammo-driven constraints. Russia's daily fire rate is down considerably from its 2022 highs. Rusi observes that in the early war, a company-sized Ukrainian position in a critical area might receive 5,000 shells from Russian artillery every day. That sort of prolific fire isn't really seen anymore. And we've seen a number of Russian figures, not just Evgeny Prigozhin, claim that the army is often suffering from ammunition shortages. Now, to be clear, the problem for Russia here probably isn't that they are out, in inverted commas, of ammunition. Instead, there are potentially a variety of factors coming into play to explain why they can't fire with the same intensity as they used to. Even if they still have millions of shells in reserve, for example, they might be of the wrong calibre, they might be in the wrong location, they might be difficult to transport to the front quickly, or it might be seen as important that the army slow the consumption rate to ensure that some storage remains intact for the future. That point around calibre mismatch is potentially an important one that we'll come back to later. The point is, Russia still has a reserve, but it has some limitations on it and they have to be careful with it. Ukraine, meanwhile, largely seems to be living hand to mouth. At this point, the country's burn rate is probably pretty closely tied to the number of new rounds that are produced within Ukraine or brought in from other countries. Now, I have occasionally seen the claim in media and online that the Ukrainians are just wasting ammunition, firing far too much of it, and they're being unreasonable with what they're requesting. There are usually a few responses that can be offered to claims the Ukrainians should just be more accurate or fire less. For one, they're using a lot of older, not very precise systems still, a lot of Soviet or post-Soviet era equipment. Reportedly, not all of the artillery they receive has its advanced fire control system. Some of them had it removed. Some of them don't come with good firing tables or information. And all of these rebuttals are valid in their own way. But to them, I'd offer one more of my own. For both the Ukrainians and the Russians fighting in Ukraine, there are a shit ton of targets to fire at. And by historical standards, consumption rates are pretty low for this kind of fighting. To illustrate the point, ask yourself the question, if the Russians and Ukrainians had an unlimited supply of ammunition, how much more of it could they feasibly use? And the answer is probably many times what they're currently firing. On some parts of the front, crews might have to make do with a handful, 10, 20 or 30 rounds per day. For the designers of the PZH-2000, 100 rounds a day was considered high intensity. But if you go back to the Korean War, you can see how far fires can be scaled relative to available manpower. When American General James Van Fleet arrived in Korea in 1951, it was before a major Chinese offensive. There was a deep awareness that the Chinese would have a significant manpower advantage over the United Nations forces and they had developed a range of tactics specifically designed to counter their UN opponents. 
What the UN had going for them, however, was superiority in artillery and logistics. Van Fleet's reported mantra was to expend iron, not men, and so he drastically increased the planned ammunition load per gun for the first week of the offensive. American 155mm howitzers wouldn't be expected to fire 10, 20, 30, or 100 rounds per day, they would fire 250 rounds per day. At that rate of fire, just the 155mm howitzers that Ukraine has received from the West would be out shooting the entire Russian army. And that's without mortars, MLRS systems, Soviet-era guns, 105s, 122s, 152s, 203s, you name it. That incredible display of firepower broke the back of the Chinese offensive. And it's a feat I'm sure both sides in Ukraine would love to duplicate if the resources were available. But as we can clearly observe, they aren't. Instead, both sides appear to be working with what they have. And as observers, we're left asking the question, where are the replacement guns and shells going to come from to sustain these two very ammo-hungry forces? And answering that question means looking at both the short and long term. In the long term, the answer is essentially industrial. How do you build more shells? But shells manufactured in Q4 2024 aren't useful in Q3 2023. And so in the short and medium term, shells are going to have to continue to come from storages. For this Ukrainian offensive, that largely meant turning to the storages of staunch US ally, the Republic of Korea. South Korea has one of the world's most formidable parks of artillery and deep bunkers of artillery ammunition. And even though the country is not yet directly supplying armaments to Ukraine, it's critical to the way the fighting is currently going. Reportedly, the Koreans have transferred many hundreds of thousands of rounds to the United States so the US can release its stockpiles for use in Ukraine. In that kind of scenario, the Korean shells would essentially serve as America's emotional support ammunition, ensuring they feel prepared for any potential contingency around the world until new ammunition can be manufactured to replace them. But that's probably not enough of a solution for the problems the Ukrainians are facing. With the offensive now being a process of attrition where artillery is needed to break down Russian forces to suppress positions to enable even the smallest tactical advances, the biggest danger to Ukrainian operations is they run out of ammunition before taking their objectives. And more than new armoured vehicles, more even than jets like F-16s, the Ukrainians absolutely need more artillery ammunition, non-negotiable. Which brings us at last to a recent announcement by the United States. Namely the announcement earlier this month that after many, many months of the Ukrainians requesting them, the Americans were finally going to send cluster munitions for Ukraine's 155mm artillery. These, it's reported, will be dual-purpose improved cluster munitions or DPICM shells. And whereas most US announcements for Ukrainian weapons supply pass with a relatively moderate level of media attention, this one caught some serious attention. To understand why, it helps to quickly clarify what these weapons actually are. The term cluster munition can describe any munition, be it a rocket, a bomb, or an artillery shell, wherein the larger munition deploys smaller sub-munitions. Often this means a weapon will hit a certain point in its flight path and eject the smaller sub-munitions with the intention being usually to blanket a wider area. If you just fire one explosive shell, you're going to deliver a lot of explosive hurt to the one point where it lands or air bursts. But if you have that shell fling out smaller grenade-sized submunitions during its flight, you can saturate a far larger area, albeit with smaller individual explosions. This dramatically increases the possibility of a hit on a target, even if you're not particularly accurate with your aiming. Given that a cluster round might spread its bomblets over 100 or more meters, you might think of this as trying to hit a fly using a fly swatter as opposed to the head of a pencil. Some cluster munitions are intended purely for anti-infantry work, some purely to disable vehicles, and some are multi-purpose, like the artillery shells here in question. DPICM stands for Dual Purpose Improved Cluster Munition because the little bomblets the shell releases can have both anti-infantry and anti-vehicle effect. Many countries have replaced cluster munitions in some or all their usual battlefield roles, as for example the USA did with the original cluster munitions for HIMARS and M270. Those were phased out and replaced with the M30A1 alternative warhead, which for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, achieves its effect not by scattering submunitions, but instead by saturating an area with 160,000 high-velocity preformed tungsten fragments. And it should probably tell you a lot about cluster munitions that 160,000 preformed fragments was considered the toned down and more humane option. While very effective, however, cluster munitions do have something of a stigma attached to them. 
with the munitions generally regarded as posing a greater risk to civilians and an increased chance of collateral damage as compared to a regular shell with a unitary warhead. That's a result of a range of factors, the biggest one being the risk of unexploded ordnance. Not all of those little bomblets released by a cluster munition are going to explode. They're not perfectly designed, so a percentage of them won't detonate when they hit the ground originally. That dud rate might be 1-3% to on some American systems, but when you're talking about older Soviet ones, you might want to add a zero. And there are reports that under harsh battlefield conditions, even American munitions can suffer higher failure rates. The key problem here is that just because a submunition doesn't explode initially doesn't mean it's never going to explode. This is a risk with any sort of munition, even a full-sized artillery shell or a cruise missile. But whereas it's sort of difficult for a civilian to accidentally step on a cruise missile, something inconspicuous, the size of a grenade scattered in a field, maybe partially covered by brush, very easy to step on and cause significant damage. And so there are a wide variety of countries around the world that disapprove of the design, manufacture, stockpiling, and usage of these weapons. And in 2010, the Convention on Cluster Munitions, or CCM, entered into force, banning member nations from producing, stockpiling, transferring, or using cluster munitions. And as of time of recording, more than 110 states have signed that agreement, ratified it, and done so. For its part, the US is not a ratifying member, but has been phasing out and retiring cluster munitions, actively decommissioning old ammunition and not replacing it. But while it is true to say that a majority of nations have signed the CCM and banned cluster munitions, it's also somewhat deceptive. Because when it comes to an agreement banning a weapon system, who has signed the treaty really matters. If you came up with a treaty banning tanks, for example, and the Pope signed it on behalf of Vatican City, that might be great and noble, but it's not exactly going to move the needle on global tank stockpiles. While some reporting has tried to depict America as something of a rogue actor in this regard, of the world's five most populous nations, none of them have ratified the CCM. And when it comes to the impact of an arms limitation, there's an even more important question than just population. And that is, what percentage of the global arsenal does the agreement actually cover? In the case of cluster shells, for example, where are the artillery pieces? Because while it doesn't mean much if New Zealand bans cluster munitions, a major artillery or missile power choosing to do so would be a much more significant step. Think of it this way. If you ask the Germans to ban cricket, for example, you know, they probably say yes in exchange for 10 euros and a couple of free soccer balls. Ask India or the UK, however, and they'd probably threaten nuclear first use before agreeing to your conditions. The more important a thing is to you, the greater the sacrifice of giving it up. So if you look at a map of countries that have signed and ratified the CCM, you'll quickly notice a pattern. Namely, that if a country has a large park of conventional artillery and depends heavily on artillery as part of its national security strategy, it probably hasn't signed and ratified the CCM. Russia obviously hasn't signed the CCM, and so most of the nations in Europe that might conceivably be threatened by Russia also haven't done so. Poland, Finland, Ukraine, etc. The most artillery-dense place on Earth, the Korean Peninsula, has neither country signed up. Neither India or Pakistan have signed up, although I imagine they take turns trying to forge the other's signature. And then we can quickly flip through a list of other minor artillery powers, like the United States, the People's Republic of China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, etc. Generally speaking, the pattern holds true. France, with an arsenal of around 100 howitzers in service and a nuclear arsenal, has signed the CCM. Greece and Turkey, with thousands of artillery pieces pointed at each other, have not. One of the best artillery-equipped signatories is Japan, which is also an island, so there are probably a few layers to their national security of strategy before an opponent gets within 155 range. The key takeaway here is while the reporting often makes it sound as if most of the world has turned away from cluster munitions, the agreement may cover a majority of nations, but depending on how you count, would be lucky to cover a double-digit percentage of total artillery systems. Neither Russia or Ukraine as signatories both began the war with some pre-existing stockpiles, Russia with a much larger one, obviously, and both have been using them throughout the war so far. Neither side really contests that they have used these munitions, although you will occasionally see arguments in the information space disputing that fact. We've seen them used in a variety of ways, from attacking battlefield targets as intended, to more unconventional usage. For example, there are Ukrainian claims that early in the war, the Russians had so much ammunition that they used cluster MLRS rockets to try and blast their way through Ukrainian minefields. 
And then there are uses that seem hard or impossible to justify from a military perspective as an outside observer. I've got an excerpt there saying that the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine had received credible allegations of at least 16 instances of Russian cluster munitions being used in populated Ukrainian areas, often with civilian casualties. You can read there for yourself a description of the locations hit. Now, 16 might seem like a low number, at which point I need to break your spirit by noting that the report in question is from March 2022. The sad reality is that these munitions have been a part of this invasion since February 2022. And so the question becomes in that context, what effect could DPICM have on Ukrainian capabilities? Answering that means answering two sub-questions. Firstly, how much of it is available? And secondly, how effective is it likely to be? The answer to the how much question, even though the US doesn't routinely use the round anymore, is a lot. The figures we have for 1994 and for 2004 both estimate around 4 million rounds of 155mm DPICM in storage. Now, when originally recorded, the rest of this slide was an attempt to estimate the current round total using tonnage figures for the US cluster munition stockpile in, I believe, 2019. But that was wasted effort because back in March, it turns out that senior members of the US Congress sent a letter to Joe Biden urging him to send these rounds to Ukraine. And helpfully, they just told us that the US has nearly 3 million of these rounds in inventory, many located at US and allied bases in Europe. These rounds exist in a kind of limbo, wherein they're still written into US manuals as an effective solution to certain battlefield problems, but they're no longer in actual day-to-day -day use because of US policy trying to push the military away from the deployment of cluster munitions. Okay, so the first answer to the question is there are probably millions of rounds of this stuff in US arsenals. The second question is how effective is it likely to be if it's sent? Now, the caveat here is that all data on artillery effectiveness is always going to be flawed in some way, shape, or form. No data source is going to be perfect. But there are some US studies here that might be useful. One relating to usage in Vietnam, the other relating to live fire testing under range conditions. Against infantry targets in Vietnam, it was estimated that it took 13.6 conventional 155mm rounds to inflict one kill on the opposing Vietnamese forces. The equivalent figure for cluster munitions was 1.7. Under range conditions, 432 conventional 155mm rounds fired against a range of targets, including tanks, APCs, trucks, anti-aircraft vehicles and jeeps, recorded a total of eight hits, whereas 145 cluster rounds recorded 173. There's a common misconception here that cluster ammunition is primarily intended to be used against infantry targets and wouldn't affect armoured vehicles. The data in the original design philosophy suggests that's not true. DPICM is intended to be dual purpose to be able to wreck both vehicles and infantry targets. And it helps that the top armour of most vehicles is going to be much thinner than the front or the sides. Indeed, some systems like RAD are basically a block of explosive rockets on the back of a truck. So much as tickle those things and they're going to cook harder than a Texas barbecue. In Ukraine, we've seen how dangerous drones dropping small anti-tank grenades can be to even heavily armoured vehicles. And as I've shown in the past, the US Army's own manual still lists DPICM as the most effective option against a range of armoured targets. So the reality is, against most target types, cluster rounds are just going to be more effective, often several times more effective, than unitary projectiles. And that, more than anything else, goes to explaining why countries that depend on artillery and tactical missile systems are the least likely to prohibit them. The increased efficacy of DPICM over more conventional ammunition has two key impacts potentially for Ukraine. At a strategic ammo supply level, it means they unlock a new stockpile of ammunition that America doesn't really want anymore, was in the process of disposing for a large part, and where, say, 300,000 rounds provided might be equivalent to receiving a million additional normal high-explosive rounds when fired against the correct target types. The other side of the coin is the potential benefits at the tactical and operational level, where, as you can imagine, firing a better round than your opponent does give you something of an advantage. At this level, using cluster ammunition against the right targets might increase barrel life. If you only need three rounds to serve as a target instead of 15, you're only using up three rounds of barrel life instead of 15. It might mean that one or two guns can do a job that would normally be done by a battery or more, which might be really important if you only have one or two guns available. And then there's the element wherein the most dangerous part of any artillery barrage is usually the initial impacts. Because once shells start landing, people have a pretty strong motivation to 
jump into a trench, go to ground, or cover and protect themselves in some way. But you're going to have a period of seconds where the targets are probably the most exposed they're going to be at any point during the barrage. This is why some advanced artillery systems are designed to fire multiple rounds on different trajectories so they all land at the same time. Multiple rounds, simultaneous impact. With a cluster munition, if you can pack more impact into each shell, you can probably deliver the same effect with a shorter barrage and move more of the impact to the front end, to those first few shells that land while targets are still more exposed. But that's mostly generalized theory. If we want to better understand the sort of impact these weapons might have in Ukraine, it helps to think about how Ukraine might use them. And one good way of thinking about that is to ask the question, what is Ukraine using DPICM instead of? In some cases, you can imagine the rounds being used instead of precision-guided munitions like Excalibur shells. Ukraine only has a very limited supply of Gimler's rockets, Excalibur, and equivalent munitions. And so if another shell can do those jobs, it takes pressure off those limited and precious munitions. A perfect example here might be counter-battery fire. If you're trying to engage one, maybe two Russian artillery pieces that are in concealed positions that may have ammunition stockpiled nearby, you might normally want to hit that vehicle with one or two Gimler's rockets or a handful of guided projectiles. Alternatively, you could use DPICM because even though it is less precise and you will miss, the nature of the round means that a lot of misses in fact turn out to be hits. You can apply the same logic to jammers, shorad systems, tanks, any particularly valuable individual target that you would otherwise task a PGM against. There's even a potential advantage against certain Russian defensive adaptations. There's been a lot of reporting on Russian attempts to counter systems like Gimler's and Western guided munitions. Two main adaptations are trying to use electronic warfare to interfere with GPS and thus diminish accuracy, and secondly to use air defense systems to shoot down incoming Gimler's rockets. Neither of those countermeasures are likely to do much to a salvo of DPICM. You can't exactly jam the guidance system on an unguided projectile. These rounds are already dumb as rocks, and no amount of E-War is going to make them dumber. And while the Russians may have been able to justify shooting down incoming Gimler's rockets, tasking air defense missiles to shoot down incoming dumb artillery rounds before they deploy their submunitions is likely to be an exercise in financial futility. In other cases, Ukraine may use DPICM to replace regular unitary rounds. Remember that if you look at the manuals of the US and other countries, usually cluster munitions would be listed as the preferred option against certain target types. Consider, for example, trying to engage a group of vehicles and infantry trying to move in close formation through a minefield. It's probably not practical or affordable to quickly program up a bunch of Excalibur rounds and stage precision strikes, but against a mass target, a salvo of cluster ammunition is far more likely to score hits and inflict mass casualties than regular unitary ammunition. So your fire is more effective and you end up expending fewer rounds overall. Which leads to a final scenario where Ukraine is using DPICM rather than nothing, rather than having no ammunition available at all. By saving regular ammunition and unlocking a stockpile of potentially millions of additional rounds, it might simply be possible for Ukraine to engage targets that normally it would have to just ignore for lack of ammunition. I'd contend that generally speaking, firing at a target is more likely to cause damage than not firing at it. And so by building up the short-term ammunition stockpile, you'd probably see an increase in Ukrainian combat effectiveness compared to a scenario where none of these rounds are sent. Of course, that battlefield value has to be measured against the very real dangers of their use. While the munitions in question may have a lower dud rate than many competitors, lower is not zero. And anyone who tries to pretend these things are safe or harmless or won't create any unexploded ordnance threat is statistically very wrong. One of the worst types of wrong. Areas where these munitions are used in any significant numbers will need to be cleared by specialist personnel and equipment before they're safe for civilians. But here's the thing I don't get about the focus on the UXO threat from cluster munitions. A bomblet might have a failure rate of a couple of percent. In that event, it kind of becomes a sort of landmine, a small explosive device that might detonate if anyone steps on it or disturbs it. But do you know what else has the characteristics of a mine? Staying in the ground, blowing people up if they step on it, potentially dangerous to civilians years after a war is over? A mine. And mines are being sowed in Ukraine right now by the million. Part of the reason the current Ukrainian offensive operations are so difficult is because they are moving through massive Russian minefields. And in turn, to help dissuade a Russian offensive through Belarus, the Ukrainians report that they have laid mines on the Belarusian border. Almost everywhere on the current Ukrainian front line will need to be thoroughly demined after the war anyway. 
And if the Ukrainians stick to their public commitment to only use American cluster munitions against military targets rather than in populated areas, then while they probably won't make the UXO situation any better, they also probably won't make it substantially worse. In making the decision to request these munitions, Ukraine seems to have made a conscious evaluation that the military utility of these weapons is worth it, that the impact in lives saved and objectives achieved is worth the risk of having to deal with unexploded bomblets after the war is over. And as a country engaged in acts of self-defense and not party to the CCM, legally speaking, that is their choice to make, one of the many ugly choices brought about by this horrible war. Having rounded out that discussion on Ukraine's short and medium-term requirements and the cluster munition answer, I think it's time to pivot and instead look at Russia, because there the quantitative demands on ammunition supply and replacement barrels of vehicles are much higher than they are for Ukraine. And so, as you've probably come to expect if you've been following me for a while now, we're about to begin our sudden but absolutely inevitable pivot into everyone's favourite topic, defence economics. Figuring out the sustainability of Russian ammunition consumption first requires understanding production. Here, the challenges are pretty obvious. The Russians are not exactly open about how many shells they produce. The relevant economic data is always going to be suspect. And of course, many Russian announcements employ a technique known to many politicians around the world, being vague to the point of meaninglessness. Putin, for example, in June made a statement that Russia had increased production of its most in-demand weapons by 10 times. Now, does that mean they have increased the production of 152mm shells from 750,000 to 7.5 million per year? Or have they managed to increase Su-57 production from 1 to 10? If we are going to use official data, one thing we can do is try and piece together different sources to get a better picture. It's not perfect, but it's probably preferable to taking whatever Shoigu or Medvedev say at face value. Here, most of the indicators point to an increase in production over the course of 2022 and then 2023 that not necessarily a transformative one. The Russian arms giant Rostec, for example, hired new workers equal to about 5% of its pre-war workforce in 2022. Consolidated revenue over the same period increased by about 2.5%, which was below inflation. Manufacturing indexes, which measure Russian manufacturing activity, were a little more promising. The category in which artillery shells would fit, so fabricated metal products besides machinery and equipment, increased by about 25% between January-April 2022 to January-April 2023. And it's possible that military production may have increased more than that because any fall in civilian production would conceal an increase in the index. That said, by the March-April period of 2023, the index wasn't continuing to grow, but rather declining. But hey, Rostart may just be lying to conceal the massive increases in Russian ammunition production. My point here is I think it's reasonable to assess that Russia has increased production and refurbishment rates for artillery ammunition since February 2022. But many of the same basic physical limitations and supply chain issues that limit the ability of countries in the West to rapidly ramp up production also apply there. And unless Russian industrial workers have begun to work for free out of sheer patriotism, while at the same time figuring out how to build shells out of nothing more than good intentions and government instructions, it seems unlikely that Russian production rates will equal consumption rates anytime soon. Western estimates are diverse, but at the same time, there is some clustering within them. The most common estimates I've seen for Russia's pre-war stockpile of artillery ammunition was about 17 million rounds, of which 10 to 12 million was expended in 2022. So far as production rates now go, I've seen a range of estimates. Ukrainian estimates of about 2.4 million rounds of all types per year, an Estonian estimate of between 1.7 and 3.4 million rounds per year, including refurbishing old shells that have passed their use-by date, and a recent UK estimate of up to 1,152mm shells specifically per year. That sounds about right for a Russian wartime production rate of 152mm shells, considering most estimates I've seen for pre-war 152 production group it around the 750,000 round per year level. So the stockpile is shrinking considerably, new production might be between a third and a half of total current requirements. So how on earth are the Russians managing to keep up the prodigious rate of fire they are presently using? The first step seems to be diversifying the equipment and ammunition in use in order to make better use of the existing stockpile. Because remember, the issue here isn't just how many rounds are in the stockpile in total, it's what sort of rounds they are. It's a similar story when it comes to barrels, spare parts, or any other component and critical input you can think of. 
And that's where storages can really come to the rescue. Russia may not be the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union and it left a whole bunch of stuff behind. So if you want to take some pressure off your 152mm stocks, for example, well, if you reactivate some T-62 tanks, those consume 115mm ammunition which you may have in storage. You can use those for fire support and potentially for artillery usage. Same thing with the ancient T-54 and 55s. No, it is not a good tank. No, the armour won't stop basically any modern anti-tank weapon. Yes, the optics and FCS are likely to be terrible, but it does have a 100mm gun. And if you happen to have a good source of 100mm ammunition, either domestically or from a country like Iran, then introducing some 100mm guns into your force can help alleviate ammunition pressures. Sometimes you just got to use what you've got, even if that means issuing people with tanks that may literally have been driven by their grandfathers. So in that context, seeing something like T-55-54 or T-62 shouldn't be that surprising. But you also see things like this, where it appears someone has bolted an automatic mortar and a helicopter rocket pod to an MTLB. Now, I'm not saying that this thing doesn't sort of conceptually maybe work. At the end of the day, all you're really doing is bolting or welding artillery pieces to the top of an armoured vehicle, basic concept. But you'd have to imagine that if there were enough purpose-built vehicles available, they would probably be the things being issued as opposed to whatever we want to designate this. I mean, I hope it's fair to say that no one is pushing this thing into service for the sake of its aesthetics. We've even seen what was reportedly a Russian guards unit deploying this particular vehicle. This, again, is the classic helicopter rocket pod mounted on the back of a ute configuration, intended, presumably, to provide relatively close-range light fire support. Now, before everyone gives into the temptation to point and laugh, I want to be very clear about the point I'm trying to make here. Vehicles like this aren't useless, and when the Ukrainians use them, people tend to cheer the ingenuity involved. The point is not that the vehicle doesn't work. The point is that the vehicle shouldn't be needed. It makes sense that Ukraine, with its relatively underfunded pre-war military, being massively outgunned by an opponent, would be forced into these sort of emergency makeshift measures. It makes less sense that what is meant to be the leading artillery power in the world is forced to make these sort of conversions. Manpower is a valuable commodity, and so if you had the specialised systems available, you would expect that the army would want them crewing and using those systems, as opposed to something that would not look out of place in a Libyan militia. The existence of these conversions doesn't prove that Russia is out of replacement artillery systems. In fact, we can prove that they still have many in storage. But it does probably indicate that things are not going according to plan. And if this is going according to plan, I would pay amazing money for a transcript of the planning session that came up with this one. Because a plan that revolved around not taking Kyiv on day 1 to 3 and then transitioning to rocket pod technicals at day 500 plus would truly be some 5D chess grand planning. And so a critical sustainment factor for Russia going forward is how much foreign support it can expect to receive. We're very confident that Russia has received assistance in a number of areas, most particularly drones and artillery shells, particularly from Iran. Western intelligence also indicates that North Korea has been a major supplier of artillery munitions to the Russians, but that claim is much harder to evidence with what's available in open source. I'm aware there's also been allegations of the People's Republic of China supplying artillery shells to the Russians, and images have circulated of shells with Chinese markings on them, ostensibly in Russian service. But all the images I've seen so far appear to be of shells that were sold to the Iranians many years ago. So Chinese manufactured Iranian shells. That said, there's always a possibility the situation might change, and this is definitely an area to keep an eye on. For example, Russia receiving artillery shells is obviously bad for Ukraine. Potentially even worse would be if Russia started receiving skilled labour and machine tools to come into Russia and set up additional production. Aid doesn't have to be military to have a military effect. Sometimes industrial assistance can be far more dangerous. But in the absence of a dramatic change in the Russian domestic situation or massive foreign assistance, I don't see Russian production rising to the level of sustainability for their artillery force any time in the immediate future. But just because Russia is having production difficulties, it doesn't mean Ukraine is getting everything it needs either. And so I thought it was worth taking a quick look at what the various Ukrainian allies are doing to ramp up their artillery production, and where that leaves a shell-starved Ukraine in terms of upcoming resupply. America continues to be one of the most important supporters of the Ukrainian artillery. Because just like some Americans have a platoon's worth of firearms and ammo in the basement, Uncle Sam, much like the Republic of Korea, had pretty deep ammunition bunkers when this all started. 
In terms of new production, however, while America is the key contributor with things like precision-guided munitions, when it comes to artillery shells, they're still relatively middling. The US voted money for an industrial ramp-up as early as 2022, and increases are now happening, the problem is America's starting from a pretty low base when it comes to shell production. And so, from a pre-war production rate of about 14,000 per month, America hopes to reach 28,000 per month in the second half of this year. A significant part of that ammunition, however, might end up staying in the United States. Compared to many of the other allies, the US is very protective of its own stockpiles and readiness levels. In part, you would presume reflecting the fact that while the European allies only have to focus, at least for the most part, on the European continent, America wants to remain prepared for contingencies more or less wherever they may flare up. This is the key point whenever anyone says that America is running out of ammunition. They're not running out in the sense that the stockpile is now literally empty. They're running out in the sense that too many additional drawdowns might leave America in a situation where it feels underprepared for a potential future crisis. In terms of production capacity for things like howitzer ammunition, the Europeans are actually far more important than the Americans. But the story of their efforts to ramp up production rates from low pre-war levels are both more polarizing and more complicated. Many firms didn't receive any major contracts to ramp up production in 2022, and a lot of the significant investments are only starting to happen, well, really now. The reasons for those delays are probably complex and multifaceted, but to give a couple of contributing simplified factors, Initially, it seems many expected a short war where it wouldn't be necessary to significantly increase production, either because Russia would win quickly, which it didn't, or that Russia would withdraw after suffering significant defeats, which it didn't. Then what followed was a long debating process over joint purchasing of ammunition, the desire of countries to protect their own domestic industries, even in the middle of a wartime emergency, and, of course, bureaucratic and budgeting delays over actually getting contracts and investments written and in force. Some manufacturers have said they can't invest in ramping up production without long-term, even 5-10 to 10 year orders, which, for various reasons, governments are either unwilling or unable to provide. I'd personally observe that given everyone's been running down their stockpiles and is likely to want to increase them above pre-war levels even after this war ends, running a multi-year production schedule is probably pretty safe. If Ukraine doesn't end up needing the rounds, then a national stockpile probably will. But negotiations for those sort of arrangements are often both painful and slow. In terms of assessing how quickly Europe has mobilized additional ammunition production, well, it really depends on where you set your bar. By the standards of peacetime bureaucracy and EU initiatives, this has been breathtakingly fast. By the standards of the common actions that were taken to stabilize the energy market over last winter, this has been slow. And by the standards of a wartime emergency, probably painfully so. But as even Russian state media identifies, the production ramp-up and capacity is there. The EU is looking to provide Ukraine with about a million shells this year and to increase its production capacity to a million 155mm rounds as well. If that happens, it's almost certain that you'll actually see a widening gap between the production of 155mm rounds by Ukraine's allies and what Russia can produce itself in terms of its 152mm shell. Given that on average you'd expect a 155 to be delivered more accurately and to greater effect than your average 152, and that's a long-term trend that should probably worry the Russians. There are also efforts to increase production of all of the various inputs and components necessary to manufacture artillery rounds. Everything from propellant to fuses to energetic explosives. But the two key points remain how quickly these contracts can be signed, and also how much the production is prioritised for delivery to Ukraine. Some countries, for example, have chosen to divert new production into their own national stockpiles to increase their own readiness. Which makes sense as a sort of instinct, but at the same time it's kind of weird to be preparing to fight the Russian army when someone else is already in the middle of fighting the Russian army and could really use some shells. The Ukrainians themselves are also working with the resources available to them to try and increase their own artillery ammo production, along with a range of other weapon systems. Now, in the past, I've talked a lot about the problems of inefficiency and corruption in the Russian defense industrial complex. I do that because it helps explain why a nation with the resources like Russia's is nonetheless not able to deliver the sort of combat power and effectiveness that you would expect. It's not meant to show that those problems don't exist anywhere else, and so I'll say it plainly here. For many, many, many years, Ukraine's defense industrial complex was a complete shambles with many of the same problems and features as you'd see in Russia. The system was weakened by corrupt or incompetent management, decay of the overall base, 
bureaucracy and inefficiency, all of which put holes in the proverbial production pipeline. The difference, of course, is that whereas Russia had enough hydrocarbon money to flush through the system and get some results regardless of all the leaks, Ukraine was operating on a comparatively shoestring budget, and many attempts at reform had previously fallen over for those various reasons. During the Poroshenko era, for example, there was a plan to re-establish significant artillery ammunition production in Ukraine. But then someone pulled that amazing old magic trick where money was spent, but no shells were produced. At least reportedly. Now make no mistake, Ukraine was home to a lot of the defense industry of the Soviet Union. The capacity to mobilize skilled personnel and resources to produce war material is there. But the process of reform and mobilization has sometimes been difficult. In a potential sign of how desperate the Ukrainian government is to push reform, drive out the old guard, and get things moving, the head of Ukraine's state owned armament giant, Ukrobaromporom, was recently fired. His replacement, reportedly, is Herman Smetanin. Smetanin, among other qualifications, is a 31 year old relative outsider. He went to university, worked as a design engineer, and then by the age of 28, he was the director of the massive Kharkiv armored plant. In recent months, there have been some positive sides for Ukrainian production figures, a reported tripling in the production of Stukhna anti-tank guided missiles, an increase in artillery ammo production from several thousand per month to tens of thousands per month. But only time will tell how the Ukrainians go in both modernizing and cleaning out their defense sector in the middle of a desperate war for national survival. Western oversight can and has been very effective in making sure that Western assistance is not diverted away from its intended purpose. But reforming internal government systems where Ukrainian money is being spent by the Ukrainian government in Ukrainian companies, that's a longer, harder and more difficult fight and one the Ukrainians more or less have to fight alone. And in the near, medium and even long term, it seems unlikely that Ukraine will be able to meet all of its own domestic requirements. Their task will probably be made slightly easier, however, by a group of former Warsaw Pact nations in Europe. For all the modern artillery systems the country has received from the West, firing 105 or 155mm ammunition, most of Ukraine's artillery park continues to be made up of legacy Soviet caliber systems. Countries like the US, Germany or France don't produce those calibers. And yet, if they had run out, then Ukraine would be significantly reduced in the firepower it had available. Having good systems is great, but a PZH-2000 can't be in two places at once. Legacy ammunition has mostly come from a variety of countries that I want to look at as a block sometime in the future. Nations like Romania and Bulgaria with large former Warsaw Pact era armaments industries, for example, have made significant contributions. They've been reasonably quiet about it, but a lot of their production facilities were reactivated or moved over to extended shifts quite early after the full-scale invasion. Slovakia has been a major provider of artillery systems, the Czech Republic has been a critical supporter of Ukraine's firepower at just about every level, and I probably don't need to update you all on the contributions of countries like Poland, the Baltic States, or Finland, all of which seem to have demonstrated a fairly let's call it invested reaction to Russian territorial expansionism, and have shipped weapons and ammunition at a rate that reflects that. And we've even seen ammunition and weapons trickle in from places in the Balkans, many of which still do have stockpiles left over from the 90s and times that people would rather forget. And then on top of all of this are the efforts of countries like the United Kingdom, who have become very adept at going around the world, finding any country with a stockpile of compatible Soviet-era ammunition, and then buying it and making sure it ends up in Ukraine before the Russians can do the same. All of this contributes to a single task, which is still very much a work in progress. Making sure that once the bunkers run dry, there's enough newly produced ammunition to keep the Ukrainian artillery in the fight. Which brings us to final reflections on where things might go from here. For now, at least, it seems like the artillery will remain one of the critical weapons of this war. Generally speaking, efforts by Ukraine's allies to train and equip its forces to fight a maneuver war, the kind that NATO forces themselves would like to fight, albeit without air support, have so far seen uncertain and mixed results. The supply of additional fires, however, artillery systems, long-range missiles, additional ammunition, weapons and systems designed to allow the Ukrainians to fight like Ukrainians, seem to have consistently delivered observable battlefield impacts. And so if you're looking for a long-term predictor of success for Ukraine and Russia going forward, you could probably do worse than looking at the sustainability of their artillery parks and ammunition supply.
And in that respect, there's a wide range of outcomes potentially still very much on the table. The factors that'll drive those outcomes are mostly beyond the control of Ukraine and even of Russia. They're factors like the risk appetite of Ukraine supporters, how much are they willing to draw down their own stocks or prioritise delivery for Ukraine rather than building up their own munition stockpiles? How effectively are they able to mobilise their industrial base? And to what extent are they able to get contracts signed and guns and ammunition shipped? At one extreme, there's a world where the balance of artillery fire inflects over time with Ukraine gaining an advantage. Ukraine's allies have the capacity to produce more 155mm shells than Russia produces 152 and to widen the gap over time. Given that on average you expect the NATO shell to have a greater impact and you expect the Russian stockpiles to run down over time, then with a combination of vehicles and ammunition pulled from storage as well as increased new production prioritised for Ukraine, then eventually you might see the vaunted Russian artillery worn down and eclipsed. Given the centrality of artillery in Russian doctrine, it's hard to see how they'd be capable of further massive offensive operations without an artillery advantage. At the other extreme, A drops off, ammunition is hoarded, and Ukraine's guns eventually have to constrict their rate of fire even further. In that universe, Russia retains a sort of trump card, a signature move that greatly complicates Ukrainian offensives and enables Russia potentially to make some of its own. At the end of the day, you're only going to have so much information working in open source. But from where I sit, I'll make this observation for whatever it's worth. If you gave me 20 billion US dollars, the ability to magically turn it into any piece of equipment or ammunition that has already been supplied to Ukraine and handed over, and I was told to design the ideal aid package, I think you could do worse than turning three quarters of it into mortars, howitzers, barrels, and ammunition for the above. Plus, you'd want plenty of Gimler's rockets to keep the M270s and HIMARS systems doing their vital work. About as vanilla an aid package as it is possible to produce. You'd almost certainly want to sprinkle some long-range missiles on the top to keep things interesting and hold targets at risk. You'd want to sustain Ukrainian ground-based air defences. But at least from afar, the direct correlation seems pretty clear. If you want the Ukrainians to go forward, give them shells. The conclusions today follow pretty closely from that observation. There are a variety of factors that go into informing battlefield outcomes in Ukraine, but there is near consensus among pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian sources that artillery availability and ammunition supply are core among them. Both Russia and Ukraine have forces that thrive on artillery availability, even if they use their systems somewhat differently. And as a result, both sides are engaged in significant industrial efforts, with some missteps and false starts, to try and significantly ramp up production and supply. If both sides leverage their available resources efficiently, eventually you would expect the sustained produced supply for Ukraine from its many allies to outstrip new production in Russia. But that new production isn't available now and may not be for some time. And so in the short and medium term, American cluster munitions and munitions sent by other countries may make a critical difference. If sent in sufficient quantity, that being the massive asterisk here, they may help alleviate ammunition shortages and significantly magnify the efficacy of Ukraine's existing artillery pieces. They're not wonder weapons by their nature, but for all their risks, a couple hundred thousand rounds of DPICM supplied rapidly could make all the difference in the coming months. Okay, channel update to close out. For me today was an interesting episode because the first time I've really been able to do a one year later video on one of my original topics. The original video outgunned released in early July 2022. And it unfortunately turns out that after a year of bloody fighting, there have been more than enough developments to merit a second episode. I hope you found it valuable, but at the same time, I hope you'll understand if I say I very much hope I don't have to do a third. As mentioned during the video, I want to thank Covert Cabal for the work he regularly does counting Russian artillery systems and tanks in storage depots. The man has probably counted at least 100,000 tank-shaped blobs at this point, and I do encourage you to check out some of his work in that regard. I meant what I said about trying to close the gaps in terms of some of the older imagery that was used there. I've ordered some custom satellite passes to make that possible, which means I also have to thank my various patrons because when each specially requested pass can run to hundreds or thousands of US dollars, it does help to have the funds there to do it. For the benefit of those patrons, uh, there should be a poll up around the time this video goes live, basically building on the idea of publishing more cut content and giving me an idea of how you would like to see it edited and presented. For now, that is all from me. Thank you very much, and I'll see you all again next week.